Hey friends, thank you for being here today. In this episode, we are going to go behind the scenes of the human brain. We're gonna learn the questions that highly successful people ask themselves to tap into their greatest potential. Mark Champagne, author of Personal Socrates, is going to join me to explain how we are all just one question away from completely changing our life. And not only that, but we're going to talk about journaling. And you all know how important that I think journaling is, that my book is accompanied by a journal, and that to me, taking action to overcome anything in life involves journaling. So we are going to have a really great conversation. So hold on to your hats because we're diving in right now. Mark Champagne, welcome to The Robin Graham Show. Oh, thank you. It is fantastic to meet you, Robin, and to jam on the show. We Just in the intro, I can already tell we are going to geek out on some serious mental fitness and journaling. <laughs> <laughs> we are. <laughs> the listeners know what a geek I am about just everything, the way my brain works. But when it comes to brain science and mental health, I am a total geek and I love to learn. I'm so curious. So when we talk about mental fitness and asking questions that make a difference in our lives, I'm like all about it. And I can't wait yeah. to talk about it with you. But before we dive into that, I would love for you to tell the listeners a little bit about your journey that everything you experienced to bring you to right where you are today. And really, I guess, being the investigator of questions. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Yeah, it's been, a, like many stories, a bit of a wild ride. And in my case, I just, I never anticipated being in this place. A, first of all, even thinking of writing a book. So that was a beautiful experience to go down. And never thought I'd be teaching people or working with teams and individuals to ask better questions and bring this whole concept of mental fitness together. All of that has been incredible, but I share that because the lead up to all of this work started just out of necessity for myself. I spent about a decade, I'd say, in the corporate world, in healthcare, specifically in sales, and then the back end of my career was all in brand and product management. But throughout that whole time, for whatever reason, at one point, I remember when I started in sales, because it was right out of university, we were all hired in this like big batch of people, essentially. And there was a group of us being flown out to Montreal for training, essentially, for four weeks. And I just remember thinking, okay, we're in a sales function. So I'm like, we're all being trained up in the exact same way in, in some capacity. Like, how possibly am I going to stand out of this group if we're all doing the same thing? And... What I got to was, you know, maybe I'll just get up 10 or 15 minutes earlier in the morning and just start reading positive content. And that decision really, if, when I look back at things now that where I'm at now, that changed everything because that was the jumping off point into, I'd say, a decade of journaling into coming to the realization that at that time I was reading blog posts and whatnot. It was just positive mental nutrition essentially to start the day and I was left with all of these powerful questions and came to this realization that it didn't matter who I was studying or who was being profiled they were all asking really quality questions and I'd write them down and I'd either journal on them in the moment based on where I was at in my personal and professional life or I'd save the question for the next morning and I was almost excited to get up early in the morning and reflect on that prompt and I did that for years and it worked really well. It helped me with some of the biggest career decisions, helped me process high stress situations, helped me celebrate the great times. And eventually though, got to the point where I was getting very frustrated with the digital tools that were available for reflection, which is what I define journaling as. So many different definitions of journaling. People get hung up on whether you're doing pen to paper or apps or audio notes and so forth. But if you think about it, the practice is reflection and we mm -hmm. all reflect. And anyway, so long story short, it was around the time that the meditation apps were really starting to pick up steam on the mainstream market, Headspace and Calm, for example. But at that time, there was just nothing that would guide people into a journaling practice from the way that I was seeing it being used, which was using really good questions to help slow down and reflect. And... That's what I set out to do. And we co-founded one of the, at the time again, one of the first guided journaling apps called Keo with my brother-in-law. 
and we had a small team and we reached a ton of people with the app and it just opened up this whole world from just using the practices from a practical standpoint to wow there's so much else out there and there are so many different people and I would almost say industries or professions that are using a practice like reflection in all of these different unique use cases and that's what I want to expose people to so it's not just stereotypical definitions that you have to be in this two week long silent retreat and journaling your life away type thing that you can use these prompts in an instant to completely change your mood your mindset and in, as you alluded to essentially your life if you're asking the right questions. Oh my gosh. Okay. I love so much about this. And I love that you, number one, were so dedicated to standing out because a lot of people I think would take that job. They'd take that training and they'd go into it being like, okay, I'm one of many and I'll do what I can. But you took that to the next level and you asked yourself that question. How can I be the best I can possibly be? And I love that you took that initiative. So kudos to you. Thank you. That's super cool. But I'm going to translate that to entrepreneurship and how we as individuals should wake up every day and ask ourselves, how can I be my best self every day today? What can I do today to win? And then at the end of the day, ask ourselves those questions of what am I grateful for and what area did I win at? So I'm a huge fan of questions and I would love for you to Give us some insight on some of those really powerful questions that people like my favorite one that you talk about is Kobe Bryant, because I'm a basketball geek, but I uh, I would love to know that insight, like what questions they ask that made such an impact to transition their life. Yeah. First of all, with questions and the reason why I'm so obsessed with them and probably the same reason you are is that they provide the pause from the autopilot of life, essentially, or work, or whatever it is. But we're often on this, just this constant track of almost not even thinking, right, what we're doing, and just in in a default mode. So a question, and let me define what that is, a good question or quality question is really, it's not necessarily that this is the best question, it's that question is well-timed for you right now and it pauses whatever is going on for you and allows you to process or motivate or prime whatever it is that you need in that moment so what i've noticed with whether it's my podcast or any of the people that i profiled and studied in the book personal socrates is that they first took the time to still their mind and ask those questions. Like Kobe Bryant, for example, the opening prompt, it's not necessarily a question he asked, it was a question that that was inspired while I was doing the research essentially to see, you know what, this is actually what is the makeup of how he was so successful. And his opening prompt was, uh, or is, how do I get to the rim? And it has nothing to do with what you would maybe default you think that it's like what is he doing to just slam dunk or drain a three-pointer it has everything to do with who he's studying like the example i use in the book is that at the time everyone was really praising michael jordan about just how good he was in all these high average point games and whatnot kobe was focused on his footwork and the nuances of how Michael Jordan played the game and where he would be and so forth. And that's where, how do I get to the rim? How we can flip that into our own use case. We don't have to be basketball players, but who do I need to study in my realm? Like who, who are the best of the best and how can I study their footwork but to stick with that example? And that's what I love about questions because we can flip really any historical example or anyone we're studying or any real incredible example in history of a brand kicking off or whatever it is and we can ask the questions to almost reverse engineer what got those people or those brands and those companies to those levels and just pause us to get us to oh maybe that's where i need to go then but when we don't ask the questions then we just continue and usually we hit up hit roadblocks until we're forced into some sort of thought yeah and sometimes i think when we're forced into a thought it's harsh to say too late but yeah. something drastic has already happened and then we have to yeah. do twice the work and really almost redevelop ourselves completely versus asking the question and taking intentional action 
And usually in those situations, what's also happening is your mental state or the emotions that are fueling your mind are not the ones that are going to put you into a clear thinking state of mind, right? There's usually fear or anxiety or you're worrying about something. And again, not to say that you can't come to solutions or answers, but it's challenging because I think you use the word, was it mental? I'm thinking mental pollution because I'm reading Quincy Jones book right now and he used that language, which I just love. But in those situations, our minds are just polluted with all of these emotions. It's hard to sift through the fog and see, oh, there's the question. There's the next step. And we've all felt this versus when we're motivated and excited and life just feels like it's flowing. That's the time to challenge your mind and start asking some bigger questions because mm -hmm. you're primed to arrive at the answers that you're seeking. So what would you say for people who are struggling to find clarity? Now we can look at other people, we can find people in our area of expertise, our niche, but it, I think it goes beyond that. And when sure. you talk about studying people's footwork, like there are actions successful people are taking in their businesses every single day. So what questions would you recommend or what thoughts would you recommend that people who are struggling to find clarity, maybe even to identify who that person they should be ad admiring and studying yeah. is? First, I'd in invite people to ask the question, what is my current mental nutrition? Do you have sources of content, whether they're podcasts, books, or TED Talks, or whatever, it doesn't matter, whatever fits within your ecosystem, your routine that doesn't feel like it's too far outside of what you would normally do, stack that with positive content or inspiring content, for example. Because the thing is, and we all know this, we all go through the ups and downs of the day, frankly, and it's really just being able to shift back into a thriving state of mind. And the easiest ways that we can do that is to jump into a book or an audio book or a podcast that, oh, I know once I'm done listening to that or even five minutes of it, that's going to put me in, back into that kind of creation state of mind. And, and then the other thing that I noticed with just even identifying those sources of, of positive nutrition, mental nutrition, is that then you feel like you have the confidence as well because you have a bit of a toolkit as well mm -hmm. and then you can start layering things on whether it's meditation or journaling or breath work there's there are so many different modalities and practice that we can leverage just like exercise right everyone has a different thing if you don't like running it doesn't rule out the whole category of exercise so for mental fitness find the things that essentially will put your mind into a beautiful state and i suggest that to start because then you have something that can pause whatever's looping for you. And gratitude is another great, like you can't be grateful and upset at the same time. I had a feeling that you're nodding in, in acknowledgement. Uh -huh. I had a feeling that you would <laughs> agree with that one. But that's one I use all the time. Like just even just asking yourself, who can I, be, who can I thank right now? And just taking five seconds to send a message, send a text message to someone who's just saying, hey, I'm just, I just want to wish you a great day. I hope you're doing well. You've made their day they're probably going to write back, make your day. And what's happening in the background is not that loopy narrative that was pausing you from whatever you were trying to accomplish, right? So it's like first start with having that toolkit so that you can deploy those things and then get yourself back into that motivated state of mind. And then you can ask questions like, what am I pretending not to know in this situation? Or where am I playing it safe? If this were easy, what would it look like? Like those are, now you get it, now your mind is primed to answer bigger questions like that, that can really unlock a whole other level of thinking. Absolutely. And a question that my coach has asked me is to like, say, for example, what would 500K Robin mm. do in this situation? I love how would that. 500, how would 500K Robin handle this? Or how would she talk to herself right now? And it's yeah. amazing the different perspective that can bring and the light, really the light to a situation. Yeah. And as you were talking, the other thing that I was thinking is, and we're going to start talking about journaling. And I have a feeling that as we move more into mental fitness and getting more mentally fit, that's going to be our segue. Yeah. But I'm just writing that question down. It's so good. Writing down uh, like 25 things that you've accomplished recently. 
And it may not necessarily be asking yourself a question. I guess it really is though. What are the 25 things that I have accomplished in X amount of time? Because sometimes we get so fixated on a lack of clarity or not moving forward or just feeling stuck. Mm -hmm. We've been procrastinating. Look at how far you've come. Because if you're sitting in that place of nothing's going my way or whatever, I, I promise you, if you ask yourself that question, you're going to discover all the things that you've been doing. And that's going to open the door to either extrapolate on those things or create new things because you'll see what worked, what didn't work. Yeah, they're all just perspective shifts, right? And I think that's what I took out of the morning reading was that whether I was reading about stoicism and different profiles from that world or business strategy and biographies and whatnot, it just allows you to shift your perspective in the moment and see a different route. Or to your point, remove yourself from the situation and think, okay, someone else has gone through something like this and it seems like that situation is even worse than what I'm dealing with right now. That just lightens things. And then again, allows you to ask a different set of questions, right? Because then you can get to going back to your clarity question. Essentially, the two questions to help there really are on a personal side is who am I now and who am I striving to become? Like now you have your benchmark prompts and we're usually all trying to progress or evolve and so forth. So it's not about self-judgment or being hard on ourselves. It's just putting out the objective and painting or designing the life that we really want to live. Mm -hmm. That 500K Robin version. And maybe that's the version. And maybe there's something even farther beyond that. But then, at least with those things identified, and I'm going to borrow some prompts from a chapter on James Clear in, in the book, but do my habits and systems support the person I'm trying to optimize to become right and am I climbing the right mountain or is that journey pushing me farther from the person I identified that I want to be so it's just it's just those are the things that at least we can slowly work our way towards getting closer and closer it doesn't have to be this giant life explode of I have to change everything in the next 12 hours but first just identifying where we're heading and then make some subtle micro adjustments and then the beautiful thing is life just starts to flow and you start seeing those opportunities they've always been there but again mm -hmm. it's just you're lifting that mental fog that's been just hiding those pathways right so anyway there's there's a million different questions but i had a feeling we would we'd start getting yeah and i and this. i <laughs> I love the habits too. Like I was working mm. with a client just this morning and it's time. She, she just doesn't have time and she hasn't been focusing on the things she needs to focus on. And I said, listen, we all have the exact same amount of time. It's a matter yeah. of how we prioritize that time and the habits that we create within that amount of time. Yeah. So for her, the next couple of weeks, her job, her assignment, her homework is to take two hours every single day with no distractions zero distractions. Her staff does not need to come to her. There's nothing life-threatening that they cannot yeah. wait two hours for. Yeah. So there's no excuse anymore. It's a matter of prioritizing that time and just sitting down and adhering to that. Mm. Starts with recognizing that, that question or asking that question of what am I doing every single day to get me to where I want to be? If this is who I am today, but that's who I want to become, what steps can I take? Exactly. To get there. Right? So I love it. Okay. So Mark, let's talk about, now we talked about mental nutrition and filling our brains with positive things. And if any listeners want a list of books, a list of references, I'm sure that either Mark or I could provide them for you. Just hit us up in the DMs on Instagram. But anyway, there are so many podcasts. Mark's is awesome. He has incredible guests on. You can find so many inspiring resources to help you start that nutrition every mm -hmm. day, mental nutrition every day. But let's talk about now taking that nutrition. And I'm thinking of this just like we do physical exercises for our body. We have to do the same thing for our mind. So as yes. we start consuming that healthy nutrition for our brain to try to transition some of those negative thought practices to positive thought practices, what are the exercises we can do to achieve mental fitness instead of being stuck in a place of 
not so fit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The opposite of mentally fit, for sure. Yeah. It, it, again, it comes back to the theme of personalization, right? Similar to what I mentioned earlier, but answering the question, what are the five activities or things that you can do or practices that you can do that leave your mind in a great state, right? And usually exercise does link to that. A lot of people go for a run and they feel really great. For me, it's very much jumping on a Peloton spin of some sort. <laughs> yeah, like I know 100% I'm going to feel just incredibly motivated physically and mentally. So for that, I start my day at least a few times a week with that mm -hmm. practice or exercise. So it's really just really mapping out what is it for you is it a long walk is it a meditation because I, I hear this one all the time I, I can't meditate and my mind is too busy don't start there start somewhere else where you can get a flavor of what meditation may be and maybe just try a shorter one for example breath work has been one that I've been really enjoying because I've been stacking in a couple practices with it because a lot of the breath work sequences that that I'm practicing have holds and in the holds is where I'm visualizing the day play out or visualizing a big goal I might have, for example. And at this point, usually a few rounds in, I'm holding my breath anywhere from a minute to two minutes. That's a solid visualization period. Plus, for me, my whole body is oxygenated. There's anti-inflammatory benefits. There's all these things going on that so far, everything I've explained, outside of the Peloton spin is maybe 10 minutes. I just wrote a bonus chapter. By the time this is out, it'll be out on Tony Robbins. And it's all about living in a beautiful state of mind. And he says, it's a bit of a harsh quote, but he said, if you don't have 10 minutes, you don't have a life. And I remember thinking, I'm like, oh, that's quite direct, but I get it in the sense that those 10 minutes, especially in the morning, can literally predict definitely the next 23 hours, including how you're going to sleep. So I'm just, I'm reflecting back of when you're mentioning the time comments, because I get that as well all the time. It's just, again, a perspective shift of those 10 minutes. If you've really thought about them and you're doing the things that you know will set you up to own your morning, to then own the day and your recovery and your sleep, that goes much farther than probably the remaining hours of the day, for example. It's so yeah. powerful. So Actually, yeah, so start there. Start figure, just start with 10 minutes. Yeah. And I actually have an a whole episode I did on time. So I will link mm. that in the show notes yes. listeners. So you can go back and listen to that episode because I think it'll inspire you to reframe your thoughts around time. So for me, it's the same thing with physical exercise. I too have a Peloton and I love it. But the thing I love, I think more than anything about it is not only the workout, but the instructors always have something amazing mm. to inspire me. Like they have yeah. these incredible quotes. I've quoted them on my Instagram before because there's always something that they say that really inspires me. It's yeah. they're human. And when you listen to them talk about, well, maybe it's abundance, maybe May is mental health month. So their rides all talk about mental health. There's all these different aspects. And sometimes it's just music and hearing a song that really is related to how you're feeling or thinking at this phase of your life. And so yeah. it can really impact your day. Not to say everybody needs to go out and get a Peloton, but they do have an app. So if you're curious yeah. about it, I think they probably offer a free trial, whatever. But, but even um, just with the music, Robin, yeah. that's something that everyone resonates with, right? There, Everyone yes. has a song that brings them back to a certain memory. Again, like maybe you set up the playlist that is your mental boost playlist. You throw yes. that on when you're in a low, take a 10 minute walk and you come back and you're out of the low for the most part. You've reset. Yes. That's the yes. difference. That's what I've noticed with 300 plus interviews now and everything with the book is that the people that have been fortunate to study and interact with don't allow the trend to continue. They have practices to break and buck the trend and reset. It's not complicated, but it's just building the self-awareness and some of those mental muscles to realize, okay, I'm going down that track instead of just spending the rest of the day, if not days down this mindset, I'm going to flip the script these are the ways I can do it. And then you're back. Yeah. And creativity, you mentioned before, and that creativity is huge for tapping into almost the homeostasis of a positive mindset, tapping mm -hmm. into, it could be coloring in one of those fancy adult coloring books. It could be drawing. It could be anything. It could be 
listening to music, but tapping into that creative energy, because that will reframe your mind. The other thing I wanted to mention is that journaling is actually very similar almost identical to meditating. So when you said that a lot of people say, I can't meditate, like I'm one of those people, I struggle because my brain just goes and goes. So it takes, like, I really have to work hard at that. Do I Mm -hmm. find a benefit from it? 100%. But it's something that is taking me longer, I think probably than most to learn and adapt to. Yeah. But because of the way taking things from our mind and putting it on paper with pen, that actually stimulates the same neurons as meditating does. So for those people that are intimidated by meditation or don't want to meditate, you can journal. And so with that, let's segue into Mark, your journaling practice and how that has impacted you, your life and all of your clients as well. Yeah, journaling, no doubt has is the most profound practice for me personally. And I would argue that everyone is journaling in some capacity if you think of the again the fundamental practice of reflection it's just are you doing it with intention and are your questions of the highest quality for you where you're at in your life right now i feel like that's the difference so for me it's just every morning there's some sort of journaling usually there is some intention setting or some affirmations linked into into the journaling just really asking questions like check-in questions how am i feeling what's one word to describe my emotions right now where in my body am i feeling those emotions right so just quick usually i'm doing that while the coffee is brewing so it's fast again stacking it into something i'm already doing so it doesn't feel like oh, I have to get up three hours earlier to do all these things. So the coffee's brewing. I'm reflecting on how I'm feeling, where I'm feeling it. If something feels off, then usually, okay, why? What's fueling that? Because whether I ask the question or not, or whether I check in with myself or not, that emotion's coming with me. And it's derailing something in the day. It's definitely not keeping me at the top of my game from a mental capacity. And that lack of energy will show up in conversations in my work. Again, just checking in identifying where it is usually when you identify you know where that emotion sits often it just, it, that in itself releases that feeling and then I flip it to how do I want to show up today again one word just set the intention for the day today I want to feel just really present and just in it and then your mind searches for those moments of present and you, you don't even realize this is happening but just by setting a one word intention or if you want to take it even bigger, I do this with teams often. And they're like, they're cycle meetings. Like, what's the one word or what's the theme for the next three months for everyone? Let's think about this. So what, we're setting a path or we're setting some sort of attention or a theme for the year for you personally. I always set that usually in, in the December time frame. And then what's been beautiful just being in this work for a while now is that I would say it's probably in the last five or six years, my practice of journaling has flipped into as I need it. So if something happens in the day, I'll take 30 seconds or five minutes to write or do an audio note or use an app, but something to pause and just process so that doesn't continue to derail my day, which that has been, I feel like that is, there's the preventative mental fitness in the morning and then I'll get into the evening as well, which, which loops into that. But now we're talking like in the moment practices that right. can be used. And I'll never forget when there was a moment where I just realized, I'm like, wow, this is, I'm not even thinking about this. And this is the gift of being in this space. It's like now it's flipped into something that can be used in any circumstance instead of staying in this kind of mental torture for the rest of the day. So there's that. That's been very useful, I would say, in the moment. Practices, breath work, I do that every now and then. And then as well, just reset after lunch. And then I think you alluded to this at one point, either while we're recording or before, but an end of day, or even I usually do this, and this one I do pen to paper, just because I don't want any screens before I'm going to bed, but just a, a quick recap of the day with mm-hmm. always ending on gratitude. Go to sleep with that positive state of mind, but you can ask questions. You can start with, what would I have changed today? Or what went well today? What can I celebrate about today? And those three prompts, actually, I also use every Friday at 3 p.m. for a weekly review. And it's that's completely changed everything for me. Because, we, again, we're on this autopilot and we forget what happens during the week, except for the bad things. We remember those beautifully. And 
we don't do anything with that usually. We just roll into the weekend and the next thing, oh, I'm not very present with my kids or my spouse or partner and friends and I'm just like thinking about the week. And then you roll into the next week and kind of rinse and repeat. Whereas mm-hmm. again, just a 10 minute reflection at, on Friday at 3 p.m. for me with three prompts washes all of that away and leaves me primed and showing up with energy as my family deserves as well and everyone mm-hmm. around me ready to go. So same thing at the end of the day. Absolutely. And I love that you said that about reflecting on the good that came from the week, because if we end our week on the thought that I didn't accomplish anything, nothing went my way, I didn't get a new client, or I failed at this, we're not only going to end our week on a negative note, we're going to sit and ponder all those negative things all weekend long. And we aren't going to be able to have fun or peace or any like relaxation with our family. And then we come into Monday feeling the same exact way. So it's a nice yeah. way to just cleanse the negative thoughts Yeah, and learn, and learn. right? Like it's, yes. I used to call those Fridays used to be, I used to call them PhD Fridays. It's, it was unbelievable. You'd say, oh, wow. It's been like three weeks in a row. I've done that same thing. Probably time to switch up the, the action there because it's not working for, at least for me, but I hadn't caught that. I, I can't mm-hmm. think of a particular example, but I just I remember those moments of, all right, we're going to switch things up. And then, yeah, t- t- the thing with just celebrate or ending on gratitude, there's just, especially every day, there are so many moments to celebrate. And the more micro you can get, the better. And you're fascinated with the brain. And when you're doing that, you're firing off mm-hmm. a neurochemical cocktail of dopamine and serotonin or all the feel-good emotions. There's no downside to mm-hmm. doing that. And it, yeah. it just, it really... It's like bringing your brain to, or your mind to, for a massage, essentially. Like bring it to mm-hmm. the spa and go to sleep. Yeah. And it's interesting to me because when you talk about negativity bias, and I talk, there's a couple of things that when you were talking about journaling too, in my book, I have the my five C's of journaling method. And it's more related to anxiety, but you can apply it to any aspect of your life. But it really is transitioning those thoughts from something negative to something positive but doing it intentionally. So Mm -hmm. if a negative thought or anxious thought comes in, actively challenging that thought, is this realistic? Is it rational? Would, you know, I could say, would Mark be thinking this about this situation or would my husband or my kids, whatever. And then if it doesn't seem a good thought, change it. And you can rephrase that. And I love even looking at that from a question. Again, is it rational? Is it realistic? Is it is this even humanly possible? Like, why am I yeah. thinking this? And then looking at the positive, the opposite of that, because that will help us control those thoughts coming in better. And then we become more confident. And then exactly. I think when we transition those thoughts, we end up empowering ourselves so much. But the other thing I was going to say is when, so say I told you, I like your glasses and somebody else told you that aren't those glasses getting old? Maybe you should get new glasses. You are like two thirds. What is that? 78%, something like that. More likely to believe that you need new glasses than you are to believe that your glasses look nice. It's incredible how our brain takes those negative words, those negative experiences, and we'll just believe them and ponder on them. All of this work we've talked about today is all about taking those negative experiences and asking those questions that can help shift the perspective, shift the mindset, and help us to appreciate every experience we have and convert them to positive so that we don't sit in that negative muck and mire of a negative mindset or negative thoughts. Yeah, you nailed it. We need those reminders because, and I wish this wasn't the case, but we need to be realistic. We're surrounded by negativity all the time. time. you, You can't turn on the news and not be surrounded by negativity. And unfortunately as well, our minds are still programmed in a prehistoric time where we're wired to survive. So we're often in looking for the ways to survive and that leads into kind of survival methods of thinking and whatnot, which fear comes up and so forth. So... If we don't have this, some of this preventative or in the moment mental fitness training in check to give us the reminders to reframe, to process, to release and reset essentially on our default programming is going to be some sort of negative track. Yeah. And, and I just say, we deserve better than that. This our is families why I do deserve my better than yeah, that. Everyone. Our families, our friends, like if we are in that place, we're 
that affects every aspect of our life, not sure. just our business, but our personal life as well. Oh my gosh. 100%. Mark, I could talk about all of this all day long, but we're running out of time. So sure. I'm going to ask you a really quick question and I'm going to ask you for, I'm trying to decide if I should ask you for your favorite quote, or if I should ask you for your favorite book that you have discovered during all your research, which do you think would be most impactful? Ooh, favorite quote or favorite, I'll say book i'm looking at my desk right now favorite book changes just like my favorite questions change based on what's <laughs> going too. on in my life because <laughs> then they're re relatable but yes. I, the one there's two i would give you two books if that's okay okay give me two books the daily laws by robert green is oh. one that is also right beside my coffee machine so there's two practices going on there while the coffee is brewing one is like you said that or like i said the check-in and then the other is opening that book because they're one page passages essentially and again just reframes perspective shifts uh something to think about and you feel like you start the day just learning something right or on the right foot and then the other i would just say author in general that is one of my authors in books that no matter what's going on if i pick up the book i know i'm gonna be in a i know i'll be able to shift my mind and that's really any book by robin sharma mm -hmm. most recent one that i read is the everyday hero manifesto which has been and he's quoted quite a bit in in, in my book as well but same thing there are short passages or short chapters three four pages max that if you read that it comes back to that positive mental nutrition that's all i need to mm -hmm. shift and mm -hmm. that those things are all at my fingertips at any point. Yeah, love it. Love it. All right. So tell the listeners how they can connect with you, learn more from you and all that good stuff. Yeah, thank you. And this is super fun. We could totally go for hours. You know, I can feel that. <laughs> yeah, the easiest place to, to find me is just behindthehuman.com. And that's my personal website. It's also the name of the podcast that I host. And you'll see the book and everywhere you can communicate at that link. So please do share. As you can probably tell, I collect these questions and I'm quite lit up by really good prompts. So share the prompts that have really made a big impact in your life. And I'd love to reshare that on this side. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So listeners, that is a challenge for you. As we close out this episode, DM Mark and I tag us in your Instagram stories. That's probably the best way. Then you can tag us both at the same exact time. Share mm -hmm. your prompts, your journaling prompts, or those questions that you have found asking yourself has really helped you and helped you move away from negative thoughts to positive thoughts, or ask us a question about this episode even. But we would also be really grateful if you shared this episode with other people that could use a little bit of extra help with their mindset. That it's no fun being with negative people, negative energy, just drains us. And we can't, we really can't enjoy life or discover peace or have hope when we surround ourselves with negativity. So let's use this episode as a great avenue for starting that transition. Amazing. All right. Until next week, I'll see you soon.